Starting with uh, a word of scripture and with prayer as we get into our lesson this morning. Scripture from Psalm 19, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honey. Let's pray together as we begin this morning. Holy God, we love you. There is no God like you, Lord, in all the universe. There are no other gods but you. Lord, as we approach your throne this morning in worship, we ask that you would hear our prayers. You would hear our songs of praise to you, Lord. You would, you would turn your ear towards us. God, we want to be a people who obeys you and who lives in, in your grace. And we thank you for your son and his sacrifice for us, Lord. Without, uh, without that, we would, we would have no reason to hope. It's in Christ's name that I pray this morning. Amen. So how do you feel about rules? Show of hands, anybody a big fan of rules? These are the people you don't want to play Monopoly with. Um, there's always a few people in a crowd who really like rules. Full disclosure, I'm not one of those people. Uh, I think I kind of have a bit of a complicated relationship with rules. I tend to dislike rules when I'm breaking them. I, I tend to like them when I would be doing what they say already if it wasn't there. And, and I tend to especially dislike rules when somebody tells me that I'm breaking the rules. Maybe we can relate with that. I have a couple, a couple of friends, friends that uh, we consider it a sport almost to play board games, games together. We can get kind of competitive about it. Uh, and, and within, within that, that group of friends, there is one friend, uh, I won't tell you his name, but his name is Daniel. Daniel. And uh, <laughs> he's one of those people who loves rules, which makes things interesting. I remember uh, I was playing a game with this group of friends, and, and strangely enough, it was one year ago today. Uh, the only reason I remember that is because it was my wedding day. Uh, today's my anniversary, and we were waiting to head up to the church building so I could get married. Last day of freedom, so we do what any guy would do. We bust out the board games, we're playing these games. And I just want you to know how meticulously I plotted my strategy on that. And things were unfolding beautifully. Uh, things were going as I had planned, move after move. Things were falling into place. I began to grow in confidence. I began to think, this proves that I must be smarter than my friends. Until the last turn around the board, when out of the corner of my eye, I see Daniel rummaging through the game box, pulling out the rule book, <laughs> clearing his throat a little bit, and I knew that it was, it was all over. Really put a damper on the whole day for me. <laughs> That's not actually true. Uh, people say that you don't remember your wedding day, but I do. I remember two things about it. I remember my wife walking down the aisle looking beautiful, and I remember Daniel looking smug and, and reading the rules to me. Uh, you may not be very excited to hear this, um, but the story of the kingdom of God, as we've been talking about this summer, is a story of a common people sharing in a common land who are united under a common rule in submission to a common law or a set of guiding principles. And, and, and more than likely, if you're like most people who live in this country in 2015, you, you probably don't take too kindly to words like submission or, or law or rule. They're not words that we really like to hear very much. As a culture in our culture and really throughout history, 
people who had a complicated and, and sometimes, sometimes a negative view towards rules. rules. On the on one, one hand, we, we cherish rules when they affirm who we are or they protect what we have or, or what we want. Sometimes even if they're not very good rules, we feel this way. Uh, if you look back at our nation's history uh, with voting laws that prohibited women or African Americans to vote, those were not good rules. And yet, for decades, they were affirmed and upheld by people who felt it was their right to vote and not others. Uh, maybe we still have that same tendency today to like a rule, even if it's not a very good rule, as long as it helps us in, in smaller ways, different ways. We tend to cherish rules when they affirm us. We like the feeling uh, of being comfortable within the rules and thinking if I just stay within these parameters, well then I'm good, I'm safe. And yet on the other hand, the opposite is true as well. We tend to despise or uh, disregard the rules when we find ourselves outside of the boundaries that they set. We tend to dislike the rules when we find that they challenge who we are, they limit uh, what, what we, we want, want or what, what we have. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's even when they are good rules that we feel this way. way. We, don't we don't like rules that slow us down, down. even if they're yeah. rules that, that keep us safe. Uh, we, we don't, don't like, like warning signs or, or warning labels, labels because they, 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 it feels they like they insult our sense of freedom or our, or our intelligence. Sometimes, sometimes we don't even like the sermon. Don't nod too vigorously. Um, when, when it ceases to entertain us or affirm us and it starts to challenge uh, the way that we live. We have a complicated relationship with rules. On the one hand, in one sense, we find our security in them. We even kind of frame our identity around them when they affirm who we are and they protect what we have. But then in another sense, they can frustrate us. They can anger us, even, when they challenge who we are or when they limit what we have or, or what we want. And, and then we take and we bring these complicated feelings that we have towards rules and, and we bring them with us when we approach God's Word. And things can be kind of confused. Things can get kind of confusing. How many times have you heard someone say, well, well the Bible is just one big rule book uh, to keep me from being me. Uh, to keep me from having fun. Uh, it, it's just all of these rules. I'm, I'm tired of all of these rules. Who says that I have to follow these rules anyway? How many times have you heard someone say, well, if you just do this, this, and this, you're good. You're safe. Check, check the boxes. Uh, cross your T's. Mind the boundaries. And, and you're good. How many times have you heard those voices on, on this side and on, and on this side and you've wanted to say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but there's something missing. There's something more to the rules of God. There's something missing in, in your understanding. You may just not see it yet. There's something deeper here. There's something more beautiful about it. I hope that this morning we can spend some time rethinking God's rules so that maybe we can sift through these complicated or these, uh, these conflicting emotions we have towards rules and we, be we can begin to see the beauty and the depth in living in obedience to the rule of God. So there's a couple of things as we, as we get going that we need to recognize about the rule of God for his kingdom people. First of all, we've got to recognize where God's rule comes from. Uh, it comes from His authority as God. But it is also founded upon His love for His people. It's, it's founded upon His desire to be in relationship with His people. And so He sets these rules, He sets these boundaries, because they're meant to preserve the love relationship that He has with His people. If you listen closely, there is a rhythm to history. There is a rhythm in creation where God seeks or God acts and creation responds. Think about the creation story. When God created the world, He spoke 
and the light came to be. He spoke, and the light responded to his voice. It obeyed him. And, and on through Genesis 1, we see the same rhythm. God speaks, and creation responds. This is the rhythm of, of life. This is reality, and it is meant to be this way. And as the writer puts it, Eugene Peterson, he says that God has the first word, and his word is love. The rule of God is founded upon love. And it's founded upon God's longing to be in a relationship with his people. See, this is what Adam and Eve did not realize. They look at the rule they're given from God, you know, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they see it, and they make it a matter of being like God. But that's what Satan does, and they buy into it. Satan tells them that if they eat of this tree, they'll be like God. And so to them, it's a matter of being like God. But what they don't see all along is that it's it's not a matter of being like God. It's a matter of being with God. The rule of God is there so that His people can be in the presence of a holy God. Because the God who created the universe, who spoke first, is holy. And he calls his people to be holy. Just as he is holy, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2. The power of Satan and the power of sin is to take these rules, the expectations of God, the boundaries that God sets, and to twist them into something that they're not. Uh, When all along, the rules that God gives to his people are founded upon his love for them and his longing to be in relationship with them. Uh, You can think about it like a husband and a wife who draw a line that they will not cross. And they say to one another, I will not love anyone but you. God is doing the same with his people. If a husband were to cross that line, if he were to break that promise, he would be putting his relationship with his wife in danger. And and I think that this is the the primary function of God's rules. God has the first word, and because He loves us, He sets these boundaries in order to preserve that love. Just like a husband and a wife have boundaries. His first word is love, and He waits for a response. So the rules of God are founded upon His love. They're meant to preserve His relationship with His people, but over time, from Adam and Eve onward, people have been breaking the boundaries. They've been stepping outside of the limits that God has, has set for them out of His love. And the story in Scripture is, is a matter of bringing them back into relationship with Him. Man has tried, instead of listening to God's first word, to get a word in first. Man has tried to be the one who speaks. And tells tells God God how the relationship is going to be. But it doesn't work that way. God God never never gives up on his people, people, though. And God God continues throughout history to give give his people guidance. To to give them boundaries. To share share with them his expectations for them. He continues to reveal his word to people through scripture. But he doesn't just give his people rules to follow and say, follow them, although he could. He doesn't work that way. The second thing we need to recognize about God's rule is that the rule of God is preceded first by the grace, the mercy of God. Consider the scene at Mount Sinai when God lays down his ten words, his ten commandments to his people Israel. This is a moment in history when God shows His love for His people. As we've said already, God is a holy God. And He's showing His people how they can live in the presence of the holy God. He gives them these rules. He gives them these guidelines so that they can learn to live with Him. But consider also the way that God showed His grace and His affection for His people before He ever gave them these commandments. He heard their cries 
when they were in Egypt. He listened to them and he cared for them and he took action. He sent the plagues upon the Egyptians. He, he drew his people out of slavery, out of the hands of Pharaoh, out of oppression. He walked them through the Red Sea on dry ground. He led them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire through the wilderness. He fed them with manna from above. And then he gave them his law. Imagine how the story would be different. If God had been down his Ten Commandments while Israel was still in Egypt, and he had said, well, if you just obey these, if you just learn to follow my rules, I'll take you out of slavery. But that's not how God does it. God shows his grace first. God has the first word. And his first word is love. God makes the first action. And his first action is delivering his people from slavery by his grace. And obedience is the response to what God has done. This is what the Gospel tells us as well in the letters of the New Testament. It is by grace that you've been saved, Paul says, through faith. And this is not of your own doing. God did something first before we ever did anything. For while we were still sinners, Romans says, Christ died for us. He proves his love in that Christ died for us before we obey. Before we obey. And I guess what I'm saying is that yes, there is a sense and there's a certain aspect in which the word of God uh, reads kind of like rules in a way. Um, we don't like the sound of that sometimes. That there are parts of this book which are setting out God's expectations. They're setting out his boundaries. They're, they're showing us how to live in his presence. And, and sometimes we can find that, or some people can find that off-putting. Uh, that, that there may be rules or expectations that we have to follow. But we do these rules a disservice if we don't first recognize where they come from and what they're all about. Because God's rule is founded upon his love. And God never set down a rule that wasn't first preceded by paying the cost first. That's what he did with Jesus. He showed grace. He gave his son. He died on the cross for our sins so that we might obey. So that we might be saved. The Bible certainly has rules to follow, but to say that it is just a book of rules would not be right. Because it is a book of God's love for his people. So number one, God's rules is founded upon his love and his desire to be in relationship with his people. Number two, God's rule is preceded by his grace and his action in the world to bring us back to him. But none of this is complete without a third recognition about the rule of God, and that is that the rule of God is aimed directly at our hearts. Not just our behavior, and not just our actions. Under the old covenant, the rules of God were written in stone. They were passed down uh, from Mount Sinai, or they were written on the, the pages of the scroll for the people of Israel to read. But a day is coming, God says in Jeremiah, as we read earlier. A day is coming, uh, God says to Jeremiah, I will, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors. No, in this new covenant, God says, I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, not on stone, on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another and say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. I guess what I want you to see is that it is God's desire in this new covenant, in this new promise of God, 
that his law be written on our hearts, that it affects us from within, that it not just be something we follow uh, with our actions, but that it actually changes us on the inside, in our hearts, because God cares about our hearts. He cares very little for obedience when it doesn't come from our hearts. We believe in a God, as Jesus continually reminds us, and as the book of Matthew shows us, who desires mercy, not sacrifice, because he desires our hearts. He cares about our hearts. Because the days of this new covenant that Jeremiah promises, we're living it. We, we, we took communion together this morning. Didn't ask John to read the, the scripture that he did, but he read the right one. We take uh, this, the juice. We take and remember the blood of Jesus in the new covenant. We remember the covenant that began with, with Christ's death. The writer of Hebrews in, in chapter 8 makes this clear. He quotes the same passage that we read from Jeremiah. And he says that Jesus is the mediator of this better covenant. He brings it about. In other words, uh, the time is now for the law to be written on our hearts. For God's word to take root in our hearts. Not just in our actions, but deep within us. Which brings us to the big question. How do we respond to the rule of God? How do we respond to God's rule? How do we respond to His word? Typically, I think, typically, I think we have said that there are two ways to respond to God's rule. Uh, or two ways maybe even to respond to the gospel. You either re- accept it and, and obey it, or, or you reject it, disregard it. That's true, but I think it's better if we think that there are three. There are three ways to respond to God's rule. Rule. There are three ways to respond to the message of God's word. The first, as we said, is to reject it outright. Uh, to stay with our lives as Adam and Eve do in that moment of sin. We make our own rules. We choose our own way. We don't have to listen to this. And maybe some of us are in a place in our hearts right now where we are there. I want to say that this is a, a, a costly choice if you choose to make it. Because it tramples all over the, the, the love relationship that God is trying to set out with His people. Second way that we can respond is that we can obey the rule of God, but we can do so out of, out of fear, out of compulsion, or out of pride, which is an easy thing to fall into. But in a way, it's just as dangerous as the first one. Especially when we think that maybe we could earn our acceptance just by following the rules. When we think that our faith in the rules will save us. When really it is our faith in God. And only our faith in God that can save us. Uh, Because the gospel is the news of what God did before we ever obeyed. And it calls us to obey. And which leads us to the final way that we can respond to His rule, and that is to obey it in view of His grace, in view of what Christ did on the cross. This is where the Word of God takes root in our hearts. And we choose to do His will, not, a, not in some attempt to earn it, to earn our salvation, or, or to feel good about ourselves, or to, or to look good to, to other people. But because God's grace has thoroughly changed us, deep in our hearts, deep in our souls, and we can't help but act accordingly. In Luke, Jesus tells the Pharisees, chapter 11, don't be like a cup that is washed on the outside, but that is filthy on the inside. Don't be like a tomb that is whitewashed and beautiful and white on the outside, but that is right away on the inside. We don't want to be like that either. Instead, let's obey God with our hearts, recognizing His love for us and how lost we would be without His grace.
maybe today you're listening and you're finding yourself in, in a place where you're responding to the Word of God, the Word of God, in a way that you should. Maybe you've grown callous to what God has to say to you. Maybe you've grown uh, familiar with viewing this book as a bunch of rules that don't apply to me. Well, if so, I think it's time to see God's rule in the way that it should be viewed as something that comes out of God's love and as something that we respond to when we recognize His grace. And no matter how many times you've passed over the boundaries, no matter how many times you've sinned or done wrong in God's sight, it's not too late to come back to Him. Maybe you've grown quite comfortable with the rules, uh, so comfortable that you may begin to put your faith in the rules rather than your faith in God. So maybe it's time to surrender your heart instead in obedience, not just your actions. I want to help with that today if you need prayers for that. Maybe today you're ready to surrender your life in a way that you never had before. Maybe you're ready to be baptized, to become a partaker in the new covenant, to have the, have the Word of God written on your hearts. And God's Spirit dwelling within you and receive that forgiveness of sin. We want to invite you to do that.